Welcome to the Sunshine Parenting Podcast. My name is Audrey Monkey, and I am your host. I've been a summer camp director for more than 33 years, and at my website and on this podcast, I share ideas, stories, and tips to help parents and anyone else who works with young people raise competent, kind, optimistic kids. Summer camp, parenting, and happiness are my main gigs here at Sunshine Parenting, so if you're interested in any or all of those topics, you've come to the right place. In episode 20, I'm interviewing Tina Bryson, co-author with Dan Siegel of the brand new book, The Yes Brain, How to Cultivate Courage, Curiosity, and Resilience in Your Child. I hope you enjoy our talk and definitely hope that you pick up a copy of Tina and Dan's newest book. I am so excited to have Tina Payne Bryson on the podcast today. She is the co-author of The Yes Brain, How to Cultivate Courage, Curiosity, and Resilience in Your Child. Uh, She's co-authored this book with Daniel Siegel, and this book is just phenomenal. I heard Tina speak at the Wake Conference back in November, and we did a Facebook Live video interview when I had just heard her give the keynote and some of the key ideas from the book, but now I've had the opportunity to read it, and I just cannot recommend this book more highly. So, Tina, welcome to the podcast, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Audrey. It's always so fun to get to talk with someone like-minded, and it thrills me that you love the book, and I'm so excited to get to share some of the ideas and talk about them together. Yes, for sure. So, to start with, why don't you just explain what the yes brain, what a yes brain is. Yes. Okay. So here's the deal. There, the brain is either in a receptive state or it's in a reactive state. So we're calling those states a yes state and a no state or a yes brain and a no brain. So a yes brain is one that is open and receptive and resilient. Um, it's one that even when something is really hard, we're willing to stick with it. We're willing to um, kind of push through and stay calm enough on the inside so that we can be curious and creative and really handle ourselves well, even when things are not going well. Um, a no brain on, and on the opposite side of that is a brain that is shut down, rigid. Um, it's, it's kind of like when we think about those times when our kids are unwilling to try something new or they're really hard on themselves or they're full of um, fear or anger and they're reactive and lash out. So it can be kind of an internalizing thing where they're hard on themselves or um, overly perfectionistic or rigid, but it can also be an acting out kind of being um, unkind to others. So one of the ways to think about this, a yes brain is one that is open and resilient in the world and a no brain is one that is shut down and reactive in the world. Yes. And I think one of the things I really love about your book is it's actually, I know it's being, it's a parenting book, but it's actually, I would just call it a people book. You could actually read this book no matter, (laughs) no matter who you are. And you, you, you present it very well, but basically as I'm reading it, I just felt, okay, I can still learn about my own yes brain. Adults still struggle with these things. We all have those things that trigger us into our no brains and we say and do things that we wish we hadn't afterwards. And one of the things, why don't you talk a little bit about the format of the book and how, you know, you have both the cartoons that we can actually show our kids and you have the section for adults as well. Yeah, so one of the hallmarks of all of our books that we are so proud about that we get great feedback about is that at the end of the book is a refrigerator sheet. So the whole kind of big ideas of the book, the summary and the main bullet points are in a refrigerator sheet so that you can kind of like make a copy of it and, you know, just reference it because I don't know about you, but I read a book and maybe I love the book and I'll take a handful of ideas, but those ideas don't always stick with me for very long. So that's a way to kind of help that become a part of of who we are and how we think. So the way the book is set up is um, there are four fundamentals of a yes brain. And so we can talk about that in a moment if you'd like. But we we kind of hit each of those four fundamentals. And within each of those chapters, we have a section that is really about how we think about this in terms of a child that we're helping build a yes brain um, with. And then there's also a section called our own yes brains, basically thinking about our own mind and the way that we respond in the world. 
And then there's a section for kids with all kinds of cartoons so we can teach them about their own brains and the kinds of situations they might find themselves in. And my favorite thing about that, the cartoons for the kids, which, by the way, are great for adults, too, is that they give kids actual tools that they can use to help them have more of a yes brain approach in the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it is so, so good. And I'm going to go slightly off topic, but it's not off topic for you and me because we talk about this a lot. <laughs> um, so yeah. in terms of thinking about summer camp, which I know you're a big proponent of summer camp and just love Huge the fan. experience yep. of it. You have a couple of different examples that you talk about in the book, but I loved especially there's a part where you explain the red zone, the green zone and the blue zone and about how being brave is really hard, but it's one of the ways that you expand your green zone. So you, can you talk a little bit about yeah. that, especially for how parents, you know, especially if you have a, an especially fearful kid who seems to not very often yeah. have their yes brain. What are some of your yeah. ideas for parents that you share? Well, this green zone stuff is so powerful. And as you know, I do training at, um, at different sleepaway camps um, for staff um, and I actually teach them about the green zone and the green zone is really a yes brain state. It's really kind of like you think about your whole nervous system and how when you get really afraid or angry or you're having a really hard time, you're more of in a reactive state, you feel it in your body. Your heart beats faster, your muscles tense up or those kinds of things. And uh, we would call that the red zone. Um, And the blue zone is also a reactive state where our nervous system is kind of turned down too far, um, where we're kind of in more of a collapse or a kind of helpless, sloppy kind of uh, state of mind. And actually, our bodies do that as well. Our, our, actually, our blood pressure and respiration um, even slow down. But when we're in the red zone or in the blue zone, we are in a reactive state, and we can't really um, handle ourselves well. We're not really um, being resilient in the moment. So the green zone is the state where this yes brain state where um, even if things are frustrated or, or scary or really fun or whatever it is, that we are, are kind of balanced within our bodies and in our minds um, so that we can be, you know, the most resilient and curious and creative and good problem solvers and all of that. When I talk to um, parents and educators and clinicians and camp counselors, I talk about how we can think about our goals as caregivers um, of other children, but even of ourselves, that really we can think about our goals as to help a child or help someone else when they're outside of the green zone, when they're in a reactive state, to get back into the green zone. And our second goal is to expand the green zone over time. So this is sort of um, a survive and thrive kind of mentality, right? In the moment, we want to help them get back into the green that survives. And then we want to build that capacity so that it doesn't that so that they can handle and have even bigger window of tolerance for difficult things so when we have kids who of course um, naturally and and expectedly might feel resistance and even specific fears around leaving home and this is all very natural and normal um, besides kind of explaining to kids that you know that's a normal healthy feeling um, that also that what's really cool is that we can do hard things and that um, we can actually practice, you know, sleeping away at other people's houses or having those kinds of separations. Now, here's the key. The key is we want to find out specifically what the fears are. So, you know, a kid might say, I'm not going to sleepaway camp. I'm terrified of going to camp. Um, I'm not going. But when you approach the child with your own yes brain in a very curious, open state. Instead of saying, of course you're going. We paid all this money, you have to go. Everyone else is going, which is kind of shaming, or we come up with these responses. To approach with curiosity and say, when you think about what worries you the most, what, what is that? And um, oftentimes it's something very specific, like what if I can't find the bathroom at night? Mm-hmm. Or something like that, where you can do some really creative problem solving and thinking, oh, well, that's okay, of course you're worried about that, but we, we can solve that. That is a, that's, a, that's something we can figure out. So you want to give them specific tools. You want to allow them to sit in the discomfort of their feeling and not distract them from it, right? So you want to say, oh, so that feels, that feels uncomfortable in your body when you think about that. Now that we've felt that and now we understand that that's what's going on, now let's be problem solvers. So we, we acknowledge the feeling, we sit in the feeling, 
but we don't stay stuck in the feeling, right? Mm-hmm. So then we move into these other states. And, you know, a fear state is a no-brain state, and it's mm-hmm. natural and normal, mm-hmm. and we all feel that at times. The key is not to say, I should never feel that way. The key is, how do I take myself or how do I help my child go from that state into one where they can tolerate it and become triumphant. We don't want those experiences to be traumatic because then sometimes the green zone shrinks even more if it's mm-hmm. too much for a kid. Mm-hmm. But we, what we want it to be is the, the, just, the just right amount of stress or mm-hmm. the just right amount of challenge for them because then when they do it triumphantly and they've been given the tools to do it, they can come home. I remember um, Audrey, my son, uh, when he went to camp for the first time, he was nine. And he was gone for two weeks out of the state. And he came home, and he was very homesick. And he said, Mom, that was the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my whole life. And then he got this little smirk on his face. He said, and I did it. Mm. And so that experience of going away to camp and sitting in those difficult feelings where we weren't there to rescue him from them, he had plenty of support and connection and all that to make it a safe enough experience for him. But what happens is that feeling that difficult experience and facing that adversity allowed him to expand his capacity and that knowledge of himself that he can do. He did something really hard, and he he was successful at it. Mm -hmm. That's such a great story, but it's really hard for parents, as you know, because you've worked with a lot of them. It's so hard to know, you know, is this going to be too much for my child? What is too much? And how do you, you know, each child's different and, you know, where their green zone is kind of naturally and how, you know, how to expand it. So that is one of the things. And I, so, but I love that. One of the things that you really talk about a lot, and it really hit home for me, that we all know this, I think we should know this, but we all need to be in the green zone. We, as parents and our kids, whenever we're trying to talk about really any of these things, and I think we often try to engage our kids in the moment when one or both of us are upset and not in the green zone and those never those conversations never work out so what they are, never no. no so what are some of your suggestions no. i guess for parents who just how you know in how to handle those emotional times when either your child is in the red zone or you're in the red zone or both of you are how do you counsel people and what do you share in the book about kind of kind of promoting getting into the green zone before you have those parenting conversations? Yeah, I think this is so key. And it's actually, you know, very much connected to what we talk about in the No Drama Discipline book as well, that the whole point of discipline is to teach. And so kids have to be in a state of mind in which they can actually learn, which Mm -hmm. is the green zone, right? Mm -hmm. And so if our job as disciplinarians is to teach and build skills so that they become self-disciplined and... Um, if their job in the discipline moment is to learn so that they can do something better the next time, we really have to be in the green zone and the child has to be. So we can ask the question like, is my child ready to learn? Um, and am I ready to teach? Or, or, you know, in the, in the moment, if it's not a discipline moment to say, you know, is my child ready to be a problem solver? Um, or are they ready to kind of be resilient? And a lot of times when they are falling apart, whether they're shut down like a blue zone or they're reactive in the red zone, the number one thing I would say, okay, so let's do, um, let's, uh, can I pause and tell you just a quick little analogy? Sure. Um, it's actually the opening story in the book. So the opening story in the book is about these children who are in this river. And it's a made up story, so no one has to worry about the children. Um, <laughs> uh, that there's these children in the river and they're, star- they're, they're traveling down river. And as they travel down river, they begin to really struggle. And so all of these adults come and start trying to pull them out to save them and, and help them survive. And at one, one point, one of the adults leaves and starts to walk away, and the other adults say, where are you going? We need you here. These children are really struggling. You have to help us or they're not going to survive. And the, the person says, I'm going upriver to find out where they're falling in. Mm-hmm. And I, I really love that story because a lot of times the work we do as parents is that downriver work in the moment. It's a survive moment. Our child is falling apart. We're falling apart. You know, whatever is going on, we're just trying to get through. Or we're really worried about our child. You know, something, something's really going on with them. Um, and then other times our work as parents is more upriver work where we're thinking about how do we get things on the right path and how do we build skills so that they, they will be resilient. So 
the truth is that most of the time our work as parents is doing both at the same time. And what I would say is that if you're in, in the moment um, your child's falling apart. They're kind of traveling down river and you're just trying to survive. How do you get them back into the green zone? The number one, the number one thing we can do in that survive moment is connection and empathy. And here's why. A no brain state, a reactive state, a reactive, uh, you know, where we're just completely, you know, not thinking clearly. Our nervous system is actually in a state of stress response as if something threatening were actually happening. And the thing that calms our nervous systems down more than anything and allows us to return to kind of that calm green zone state is safety and connection. Mm. And so, you know, even if our, and and sometimes red zone behavior or states of mind lead to really bad behavior. You know, your kid slamming a door or being disrespectful or something like that. So even if it looks like bad behavior, the quickest thing to calm the nervous system down is empathy and connection. So something like, oh, buddy, you're so, like, let me, let me give a specific example. So I was working with this family. They had a a son who lived in the red zone. He had some other things going on. He had some sensory processing challenges, but he kind of lived in the red zone. And what would happen is the red zone becomes contagious. Mm. So he would get really reactive. Mom and dad, there was a lot of yelling and a lot of chaos and um, all of this stuff. And so, what I, when I was te- talking to the parents, I said, you know, when he is in that state and he's screaming and yelling at you and you scream and yell back, both, both of you are triggering each other's no brain states mm. because the brain cares, number one, about safety. And if you're screaming at someone, um, you're basically threatening them. And so when our brains detect threat, we go into a reactive state in order to survive. All our fight, flight, freeze stuff comes on. So I coach this family to instead Dead, even when the parents felt like going green zone, a red zone and even when the parents felt like yelling, is to really slow things down. And so what I actually coach these parents to do, and this is one way we can bring in empathy and connection, is to sit in a really relaxed posture below the child's eye level. Mm. So the child is, you know, standing or sitting or whatever. If the parent just sits on the floor in a relaxed posture, and people do this sometimes instinctually without knowing the science, um, is to sit in this relaxed posture and to, number one, stop lecturing and say something empathetic like, oh, buddy, you're so angry right now. You're having such a hard time. I can see how upset you are. Mm. So just that. And then the second part of that is to say, I'm right here with you. Mm. And, you know, just that empathy um, piece of just saying, I see you. I see how hard it is for you right now. And I'm right here with you. Just doing that allows the child to feel safe and allows their nervous system to go into a state of connection, and it actually reintegrates the brain and allows them to be sane, <laughs> sane mm. again. Um, and I think, you know, this is not just a nice thing to do for our children. Um, there's two really important things that are happening when we can do something like that. And we don't have to sit on the floor. That's just a really effective way to do it because mm-hmm. it tells the other person's brain really quickly, you know, that this person's not threatening, Mm -hmm. not going to be a threat. Mm -hmm. Um, But something really important happens, and this is such a strategy for parents, too. You know, I know from my own experience and in working with lots of other parents, um, counting to 10 never worked for me. I Mm. still would yell at the end of 10, you know. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It just didn't work for me. Um, But um, uh, movement helps release some of that um, red zone energy. So just getting up and moving your body, especially not towards your child in an aggressive way, but moving your body, getting your child to move their body. So if your child's starting to move into the red zone um, or starting to shut down to say, hey, let's, you know, let's play keep it up with the balloon or actually better to not tell them what you're going to do, just toss something um, that they will catch and then you have some sort of game. But movement helps, um, helps green zone stuff too. But when you stand over a child and you start to yell at them and point your finger and you have an aggressive tone of voice, it activates the neural networks of I'm fighting right now. I am going to win. I am going to be threatening. But if you sit in a relaxed posture or you force yourself, even though you feel like yelling, to take a breath, to create a pause between your your desired, you know, the stimulus that's happening in front of you and your desired response, to stop and pause, to take a breath, and to 
instead say something empathetic like, oh, this is really hard for you right now. If you force yourself to say something empathetic or to put your body in a, in a you know, a posture down below in a relaxed um, posture, it actually totally activates different neural networks in our brain. Mm. So the brain's an association machine. So if I'm standing across from you, Audrey, and I'm yelling at you and I have an aggressive look on my face and I'm wagging my finger at you, it's going to activate my fight circuitry. Mm -hmm. But if I sit down in a relaxed posture and I say, you're having a hard time, what's going on? Mm -hmm. A totally different set of circuitry gets activated. Mm. And so that is one of the best things we can do as parents when we feel like we're in the red zone um, is to kind of activate a different neural network by how we move our bodies, by how we talk and use our voices. But if we can't get there, if we're too, too red, it's better to say, I'm too upset to interact with you in a respectful way. I'm going to go calm down and to model that for our children mm-hmm. and to just go and take some time to calm our own nervous systems down. Oh, absolutely. I mean, first of all, I could just listen to you sharing your wisdom all day <laughs> because everything you say, I'm just like, yes, that is so true. So a couple things, we have to kind of wrap this up because we're getting close to the end of a time. But I really want you to share, yes. first of all, where people can find your work. And especially, I know people in the Los Angeles area, just talk a little bit about the Center for Connection as well. Um, yeah. so that Because I just, so much of your work I know resonates with parents and it's so important what you're sharing. So where can people find find you and your work? So the easiest place to find me is tinabryson.com, and that's B-R-Y-S-O-N. And um, there's links there to um, my center, which is the website for the center is thecenterforconnection.org. And we're really proud of our Center for Connection. We have a team of about 25 people. Um, We meet together two hours every week to approach with curiosity and really peeling back the layers of what's really going on with a kid or an adult or a couple or a family. Um, And we've got a multidisciplinary team to help us curiously kind of peel back those layers to figure out the best intervention. And um, so, and I've got, you know, on my website, I've got tons of articles and little videos and um, a newsletter they can sign up for and links to my Facebook and Twitter page. So it's easy to find me. Okay, perfect. Well, I find you all the time, so I know that they can too. So, um, so all of your books are fabulous, and I it was fun. I had a conversation with. I was talking to some parents at a football game this fall at our my kids' school, and I said, "So, what are you reading?" And they both laughed and said, "Oh, we don't have time to read." And I remember thinking, "Oh my gosh, I guess not all parents read, you know, like I do." But I want to yes. say um, you shared with me before that the Yes Brain is going to be an audio book as well. So maybe people That's who right. don't want to read could listen to it. But I will also say that this book is not a long book; it's very undaunting. So it's I th- supposed to be a yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, all of our books, but all of our books, but especially this one, even the shortest of the three are written with like the exhausted blurry eyed parent in mind. And yes. it, they really are quick reads. Oh, it's, it's fabulous. I mean, and so I just want to say that even for people who aren't normally reading parenting books, this one, I really recommend it has lots of great cartoon pictures. And like you said, the refrigerator sheet, it's a very uh, friendly read. <laughs> and like I said, I feel Good. like it was also a self-help book for myself as I read it. <laughs> I was going through <laughs> thinking about it both as uh, just a person, how, how, helpful at all is. So Tina, thank you so much for the work that you're doing and what you're sharing. I just can't recommend this book enough. I want all of the Sunshine Parenting listeners to read it themselves so we can continue the conversation around these great ideas that you share in the book. Well, I'm just, I love what you're doing in your work as well, Audrey. um, And I think, you know, your camp has a yes brain approach to child development. And so it's just so lovely to interact with someone who embodies and works from this place. And so it's always such an honor to get to visit with you. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Tina. And I'm sure we will have to connect again because there were about five other things that I wanted you to talk about today, but we didn't have time. (laughs) So so we'll do it again sometime. (laughs) Thanks again for being on. Thanks, Audrey. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of the podcast. For notes, links, and further information about Tina and her latest book, visit sunshine-parenting.com and search for episode 20 or The Yes Brain. 
I'd also love to include you on my email list where this year I'm sharing tips and information on how to have more connected, happier families. You can join my email list at sunshine-parenting.com. I'll finish off this episode with a quote from Bryson and Siegel in their book, No Drama Discipline. Even if an emotion seems ridiculous to you, don't forget that it is very real to your child.